Good morning. Aren't you glad that this series is 12 weeks long so you can see that video 12 times? It just really doesn't get old. It's good to be with you for worship this morning, and hello to all of you with us joining online from homes all over the place. Great to be with you as well. A few opening comments this morning. One, uh, God bless Arkansas and Vanderbilt. <clears throat> Alleluia. Um, no, also thank you for praying as Reuben and I traveled to Malmö, Sweden, and Prague, Czech Republic. Um, uh, got home actually yesterday at one in the morning. So tired, but uh, heart is really filled up from all that we experienced, people we met, conversations that we shared, and God is just moving in amazing ways, but ministry is difficult. It's hard in Europe. Uh, was not aware until I was there that Czech Republic is approximately 90% proudly atheist or agnostic. They don't need God, want God, don't wanna talk about God, uh, and so even the missionaries there that we support, uh, as we're out to lunch, we're blessing the food, we're praying with our heads up and eyes open uh, just to not blow their cover right there in the, at this university that they're serving at. And so ministry is really, really hard there, and I'm asking you to remember our missionaries and our partners around the world in prayer. You may not know all of their names or all of their locations, but it is important as a part of this church that you continuously pray over them and for them for God to bless them and bless their ministry. I also want to ask all of you to be in prayer because we, we were just notified uh, that missionaries that we support in Lebanon um, have apparently been cleared on a flight tomorrow uh, to get out of the country and, and be safe. So uh, please keep our missionaries in prayer. I'll also tell you, uh, I, I, all of my flights, all of my flights were on time on that trip. It is a miracle. And it may not be much of a sign of God's favor on my life as much as it is a sign that Dave Brown was not on that trip. <laughs> every time, every time. Travel with Dave Brown, you're destined to spend eight hours at Chicago O'Hare. Mercy. Hey, we're doing this series in the way because we've talked a lot about the way of Jesus this year, and we acknowledge that there are several things that get in the way of the Jesus way, and we're talking about those things, 12 of them. And I started the series by talking about how shame and condemnation get in the way, right? Shame and condemnation, and specifically addressed that because as we talk about 11 other subjects this fall, we didn't want you to ever walk away from church feeling ashamed or feeling condemned if we're talking about something that you wrestle with, if we're talking about a hurdle that maybe has tripped you up in your spiritual life. We don't want to be ashamed and condemned people. We're people of God. We live under grace. But um, I, I preached on that, and then my friend Scott comes and tells me, I've got a great sermon that could complement that sermon on a topic that you're going to hear about from Scott this morning and I'm so excited to have him here. Scott Johnson lives and works in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He and his wife, Beth, who's here as well. Beth, always love having you here. They've been married 42 years. They have four children, seven grandchildren. You, you'll see a photo of their family in just a moment. Uh, I was introduced to Scott by one of our former members who now lives in Texas. Trent Gudgel introduced us about seven years ago, quickly learned about his gift of teaching the Bible and since meeting him, he has taught in several spaces here at Redeemer Men's Fellowship, quarterly breakfast, Sunday school classes, etc. Scott routinely teaches in churches across our city and also all the way to the continent of Africa where he's invited to go teach once a year. So Scott, I just want to say thank you so much for your service to the church here close to home and also afar. And thank you for teaching at Redeemer today. I love you very much, and I want all of us to welcome Scott Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate Adam's introduction because he said some of the things I was going to say, which gives me an extra minute, and I always need like five extra minutes, so this is good. My name is Scott Johnson, and Adam told you a little bit about my family, and we're going to show you a picture of the family up here. It shows all four of our adult children and five of our grandchildren. 
because uh, a couple of the grandchildren have been born since this photo was taken. The photo was taken a year and a half ago. If we have the photo, there we go. So all the five of the grandchildren that we had at the time are all in the photo, but two more have been added since then. How many of you are grandparents? Like all those things, all those people said to us all those years, they all came true, didn't they? Uh, all about how great it is and everything. And so in that picture, the little guy that's being held by the woman on the left, he was one. On the right is my dad and his wife. He was 85 last year. So we had him from one to 85 all together last year. And then we had the two others born since then. I want to put up uh, these symbols. And I, I realize, Ryan, I threw you a curveball. Sorry about that. Let me put these symbols up. And I want to ask you what these symbols are. Anyone recognize those? What are those? Yeah, who said it? The undo button. I was schooled this last week by Dave and Leanne that if you're an Apple user, how many of you are Apple users? If you're an Apple user, it's Command Z. So if I'm speaking your language there, that's good. But for us Windows laptops users, it's the undo button. What does the undo button do? Yeah, it turns back the clock, doesn't it? So you're typing that report and you, and you accidentally delete a paragraph. Well, you click that button, it's back. You accidentally deleted some rows in your spreadsheet, it's back. You change the format of something, you're trying something out, you look at it and you go, no, that didn't work at all. You click that button and it's all undone. It just sets the clock back as if that thing you did never happened. It's as if it never happened. In Microsoft programs, you can go back many, many steps, dozens, I'm not really sure, maybe all the way back to when you opened the file. But I can assure you, I use all three of these buttons on a regular basis when I'm using these programs, and I use them probably hundreds of times, putting the notes together and the sermon information, the slides for today's teaching. For a little extra credit, I'll show you that the blue one it goes with Word, right? The green ones with Excel and the orange red ones with PowerPoint. And again, I've used these buttons extensively. So let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you, like me, how many of us have something or some stuff in our past that we wish wasn't there, we're not proud of? We wouldn't want our friends, our kids, or our grandchildren to know about. We'd give emphatic advice to somebody else to avoid. If we could talk to somebody else who was thinking about doing that thing that we wish we hadn't done, we would, we would implore them, don't do that, don't do it. This, this is what happened. Or if we had an undo button, like the ones you saw up there, if we could click that undo button, if we could go back in time and click it right after we did that thing, we would turn, we'd jump at the chance to do that, to turn the clock back and reverse time as if we had never done it. That's the essence of, of what this sermon is about today. I call it guilt versus conviction. I'm pleased to report that I have three points today. I don't know what the deal is with three points, but I heard Dave's excellent sermon last week, and he was talking about how three points is a thing here. It happens that I have three points. I have numerous subpoints, but we don't count the subpoints, do we? Am I safe there? So we don't count the subpoints, but I've got three main points. The second point is guilt, and the third point is conviction. But I start with this point because the, the first point is what really motivates me to give this talk. And it is simply this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a job. You actually have a position and you have work to do. You have a position and you have work to do for God's kingdom. Your position, Paul writes to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's the gospel message. He's committed that to you. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. You're an ambassador, you're an emissary, you're a representative of Jesus Christ everywhere you go and with everyone that you interact with. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, Paul writes this, and by the way, this is the first verse or the first passage I adopted as like a life verse. It's really a life passage because it's two verses. But Paul writes, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts known and read by everyone. You show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. I don't think of myself every day as a letter, and you probably don't either, but you know, you're a letter written by God to other people, and they're reading you. They're reading a love letter from God. What do they read when they see you? What do they, what do they hear from you? What do they see in you? It's a wonderful analogy Paul gives us there. So, 
You have a job to do. You're an ambassador for Christ. And you have stuff to do. You have work to do in your job. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is a familiar passage to us evangelicals. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, lest any man should boast. But right on the heels of that is Ephesians 2, 10. And Paul tells us we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, excuse me, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You have work to do. I wish I could sit with every one of you for just a couple of minutes. I would look you right in the eye, and I would tell you with 100% certainty and confidence, you have work to do that God has prepared just for you to do. If you don't do it, he's not going to give your work to anybody else. He'll still accomplish his will, and he'll do what he purposes with or without your participation, but he's not going to give your assignments to anybody else. He yearns for you to take them up and do them. And I can tell you, it's the best work you'll ever do in your entire life. I'm now 80% retired from my job. I've had a, a really interesting career in business, much more interesting than I would ever have imagined when I graduated from college all those 42 years ago and got married. And I've, had, I've finished working for Dart and Zinc and Zico, my favorite boss, a really interesting job. But doing God's work is better than my best day at work. Doing the work God has set up for you is better than your best day at work, no matter how good your job is. It just doesn't get any better than that. So that brings me to guilt, the second major point. And the reason I think this message is so important is so many of us let that stuff in our past interfere with the work and the assignments God wants you to do right now. And I hope that today, if you're burdened by that, God is going to free you from that. He's already freed you from that, but I hope he's going to drive that in through this sermon today. So guilt has many definitions, but we're going to give it this as our working definition for today. Guilt is a counterproductive shame you feel over something in your past. I'm going to pause there for just a moment. I'm going to say that again, and I want you to all say the word past with me, because this idea that guilt is rooted in things in your past is really key to understanding the difference between guilt and conviction. So guilt is the counterproductive shame you feel over something in your... We're going to do that one more time, and I want you to say it a little more like you mean it, okay? We're going to do that one more time, because I really want to drill this in. Guilt is a counterproductive shame you feel over something in your past. In your past. That cannot be changed. It's there, all right. You know it's there, and you're always going to know it's there. It's there but for which you have already been forgiven by Jesus Christ. You're already forgiven for it. Guilt interferes with your present and future, sometimes in very subtle ways that we're not even aware of. So can I just get real with you for a moment this morning? Can I just get real with everybody in here? I want you to look around the room for a minute. Take a good look around the room. There's a few hundred really great people in here. So I want to say this to all of you. Guess what? You're guilty. You're all guilty, right? I, I see a lot of terrific people in here, but every one of you, just like me, is guilty. We're all guilty of sin. We're stuck with it. We were born with it. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you're guilty. Now, second sub-point, okay, under guilt. I'm going to refer to Hebrews chapter 10 quite a bit in this sub-point. And I want to explain just for a moment the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written by an author that we're not, we're not, we don't know who wrote it, but he or she wrote it to Jewish Christians who were trying to process and understand the vast difference between what they were used to in their Jewish tradition and the Jewish law and the new covenant under Jesus Christ. So the purpose was to try to bridge the gap. It's like a hinge between the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and the New Testament. What you're going to hear here in chapter 10 that the author is, is telling us is the old system was rife with repetitiveness and futility. Repetitiveness and futility. So we'll just start in verse 1. The sacrifices under the law of Moses were repeated again and again year after year. Repetitiveness. Again and again year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing. Futility. They were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, 
would no longer have any consciousness of sins. Not only would they not feel the guilt, but the way the ESV translates this, they wouldn't even be any more aware of their sins. We're going to jump to verse 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again. Day after day, same sacrifices again and again. Repetitiveness, which can never take away sins, futility. Repetitiveness and futility. Then the author goes on to what we call chapter 10, verse 12. But our high priest, Jesus Christ, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice, no more repetitiveness, good for all time. A single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. No more futility. Then he, now we're going to pause there for just a second. Then he. I want you to picture, maybe you're working in the yard all day. You're cutting the grass, you're edging, you're weed eating, you're trimming the shrubs. You smell like grass clippings and gasoline. You wound up the cord for the electric equipment. Of course, I'm dating myself because it's all cordless now. You put the lawnmower away, you've got everything done. You're worn out. You just want to rest. Or maybe, I don't mean to be too gender stereotyped here, but maybe, maybe ladies, you've been working in the kitchen all day. You've got pots on every burner on the stove, stuff in the oven, timers going off. People are going to show up in about 20 minutes and everything, you've brought everything to the finish line. It's all ready to go. You're finished and you just want to rest. What do you want to do when you think about rest after you've been working all day? What do you want to do to rest? What do you want to do? You want to sit down, right? That's the first thing you want to do, sit down, preferably in a comfy recliner where you can lean back a little bit. Like not one of those uncomfortable wood chairs, but a chair where you can lean back. So I want you to go back to Hebrews here. Chapter 10, verses 12 and 14. Our high priest Jesus offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down. He sat down because that's an indicator that he was finished. It was done. It was completed. He had finished his work. He sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. For by that one offering, no more repetitiveness, he forever made perfect, no more futility, those who are being made holy. So instead of repetitiveness, now we have finality. It's finished. Instead of futility, we have completion and closure. We'll wind this up with with verses 17 and 18. Then the Holy Spirit says, I'll never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. I love how the author captures this. The Holy Spirit says, we won't remember them. God knows about them. He hasn't forgotten them. But God is choosing to proactively disregard your sin. He's aware of it, but he's proactively disregarding it. He's proactively not remembering it. He's not counting it. He's not dealing with it anymore because he has dealt with it. I think also it's really important for us to confess not just our specific sins, but our sin nature. Just being honest with you, I doubt that I'm aware of 10% of my sin. I may not be aware of 1% of it. Every so often I know I've done something I absolutely shouldn't have done. But you know what the Bible tells us? We're also, we're just sinners. Romans 5.12, Paul writes, sin came into the world through one man. That would be Adam. And his sin brought death with it. As a result, death has spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. I need to tell you something really important this morning. This is a really important theological truth. You are not a sinner because you commit sins. That is not what makes you a sinner. You're a sinner because you were born to a species, to the human race, And you're stuck with sin. You were stuck with it from the moment of conception, David says. You're not a sinner because you sin. You're a sinner because you were born to the human race. And everyone since Adam's time has been a sinner. But that said, we shouldn't allow our past to obstruct God's plans. I think if I said to you, are you you allowing your past to obstruct God's plans? Most of you would say, no, I don't think so. But if I said to you, is your past interfering with your willingness and your feeling of value to God to do the work he's giving you, a lot of you might say, yeah, it probably is. But his plans for your life are still his plans. 
So when we allow our past to get in the way of doing the work he's created for us to do, we're really interfering and obstructing his plans. They just happen to be his plans for our life. I love what Paul wrote to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.15. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I was the worst. Now there's actually an intentional typographical error in that, which I introduced to it on purpose. Does anyone see what it is? Does anyone recognize it? Let me tell you what it is, but before I do that, for 20 or 30 years, this is how I remembered that verse. I had it mentally indexed that somewhere in there it says, Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I was the worst. I was looking at this passage for a different talk one time, and God dropped a ton of bricks on me. God does that a lot. I've had a lot of tons of bricks dropped on me by God over the years. And here's what it really says, of whom I am the worst. It's not past tense. Paul's not saying he was a tremendous sinner and then he got better. He's writing, half, he's writing the letters that are going to become half the books of our New Testament. And he says about himself, I am the world's worst sinner. So not only can you look around the room and see a few hundred really great people and you're in good company, and I don't mean to minimize sin by saying that, but you've got Paul who wrote half the books of our New Testament who says, I am, present tense, the worst. You're in, you're in great company. We're all stuck with it. But he also wrote around the same time, within a few years of this, probably before Timothy, he wrote a letter to the Philippians. In chapter 3, he says this, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul's telling us there? I'm the world's worst sinner, and I don't pay any attention to it because I'm living with a view to the future. I'm straining toward the prize that God has called me for. I'm doing the work God's giving me to do. By the way, Paul was also an elite Jew. He was a Jew of Jews, very credentialed, very studied, really like an up and coming, higher up. And he's also telling us here, none of that means anything to him. All those credentials that he had, all the letters he had after his name as a Jew, he's saying, that doesn't mean anything to me, nor does my sinful past, because I am living in the present and I'm looking toward the future, and that's what I have my sight set on for my entire life. I cannot encourage you strongly enough to adopt this kind of thinking that Paul gives us here and look forward. Stop looking back. Look forward. Grab a hold of the work that God's, that God's given you. Discover, uncover what it is. Spend time with God and experience what he's got for you to do and move forward. I want you to picture yourself having a cup of coffee or a cup of hot tea or something with Jesus. It's just the two of you. You're in some quiet place. Maybe you're at a table at Starbucks. Okay, I guess it's not Starbucks because I said it was a quiet place. Maybe it's uh, your kitchen table at home. Maybe you're sitting on the back patio and you've got your coffee and Jesus has, has joined you and you're saying this to Jesus. Don't you know about all the stuff I have in my past? I can't, I can't do that work. It would be hypocritical of me to do that. If people knew about that, I wouldn't have any credibility at all. They'd laugh at me. This is how I think Jesus would respond. First of all, I think he would look into your eyes, and when he looked into your eyes, you would know he was looking into your soul. You would know that he knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He would know everything about you. And I think he would look at you with pain in his eyes. Not pain for him, but pain for you. He would grieve that you feel that way. And he would, he would look at you with disappointment, not disappointment in you, but disappointment for you. And he would speak yearningly, and he would implore you, and he, would, he might say something like this. I know about all that stuff. Don't you know that I've paid for all of it? I dealt with all of it for you. No one else could do that, but I've done it. I've taken all of it off of you. Your whole rap sheet is stamped paid in full. I want you to stop worrying about that. I paid the highest possible cost to deal with it, to close it for you. 
I've got such great, fantastic work I want you to do. You'll never have any better work in your life to do. I want you to grab a hold of this and get on with it. Stop looking back. Look forward. That's what I think he would say to you. I don't have a specific scripture for that, but I'll tell you, I think it is embodied in all the scriptures that we're talking about today. Last point, last sub-point under guilt. Your past may well be a powerful tool in God's hand. I'm not imposing this on you. It's not for me to burden you with this. But I'm just saying some of you may feel a lead from God, that your past is something God is going to use, not just something for you to be embarrassed about and ashamed of, but something he's going to make into something beautiful. God often uses the darker elements of our past through us to help other people. Yielding your past to God's purposes can serve you and others in ways you can't We've seen many ministries, haven't we, get birthed by people who had a past, they overcame it, and now their whole ministry is about helping other people overcome that same thing. So there's, there's my finish on guilt. I need to bridge, by the way, I think everything I just said fits so well with Adam's initial sermon, which I've listened to twice on the podcast. Everything I just said fits very well with his sermon. He said shame and condemnation, I'm just using the word guilt. I need to transition to conviction, and I thought about how to do that. I could use the word but, but but tends to erase everything I just said, and I don't want to do that. If you sent me an invitation to come to a party, and I called you up and I said, I'd love to come to your party, but I'm probably not coming, right? I just erased everything I just said. I thought about using the word yet, but yet has a little bit of that same tone that maybe I'm, I'm reducing what I just said. I don't want to reduce what I just said at all. So I think the right transition is for me to say, at the same time. At the same time is there's guilt that can be present in our lives. There's also conviction. And sometimes they feel similar operationally for us in our daily life, but they're not the same thing at all. In fact, they're diametrically opposite because guilt comes from things in your, say it again, past, right? And conviction is here and now. So here's our working definition of conviction. Conviction is an invaluable gift from the Holy Spirit, a tug or nudge in your conscience to help you turn from a pattern of sinful behavior or a sinful choice you're considering or move positively in a direction God is leading you. So God either wants you to turn away from this or you're you're sort of stuck right here and he wants you to move toward that. He wants you to turn from something or he wants you to move toward something. Unlike guilt, which springs from events in your, say it like you mean it, events in your, past. They cannot be changed. Conviction is a very present sense of right versus wrong. Heeding it will help you make the right choice in a current circumstance that affects your future path. So first, back to Hebrews 10, 16, the Holy Spirit guides our conscience as believers in this life. This is the new covenant I'll make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. So the Holy Spirit is guiding us day by day, minute by minute. We're accountable for what we know to do. James, I think of as just the in-your-face book. He's just in your face from the beginning to the end of the book. And in 417, he says, if anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. He takes the box around the Ten Commandments, and he just sort of blows it away. And he says, you know, it's, it's, it's about more than I did these things and I didn't do these things. It's about when you know something you should do and you didn't do it, that's sin for you. He's talking about conviction. When you know something, when you have a nudge from God and you know what you should do or you know what you shouldn't do and you choose the opposite, that's sin for you. The the box is off, the limits are off, the Ten Commandments there. Where's my math people in here? Who's who's a math person like me? It's okay to admit it. It's, you know, there's, there's treatment for it. It's all right. Where's my math people? Come on. Like if there's numbers laying around, I'm probably looking at the numbers, trying to process and see if they make sense. Paul writes something I find fascinating at the end of Romans chapter 5 and into Romans chapter 6. He starts by saying, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So let's pause there for a moment. So math people, grace is a good thing, right? And Paul says, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So if grace is a good thing, All of us math people are going, wait a minute, wait a minute. That means, shouldn't we sin as much as possible? 
So God's grace is gushing out like a fire hydrant, spraying everybody on the street with grace. So Paul knows that I'm going to read this 2,000 years after he wrote it. He knows it, so he's going to circle the wagons. So let me finish that part from chapter 5. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then he circles the wagons for us math people, us math geeks. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Then he says, by no means. We could paraphrase this, no way. No way we shouldn't do that. By no means. We are those who've died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And then he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he tells us, no temptation has overtaken you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He does that through conviction. He does that through nudging you away from that temptation. Temptation, by the way, can be temptation to sin, to do something we shouldn't do. But sometimes we have a burden in our life or some catastrophic thing or the loss of somebody really dear to us. And sometimes that becomes a temptation to turn from God. It's not just a temptation towards specific sin, but it can be a temptation to turn from God. And I hate, to, I hate to be the one to tell you this this morning. Sometimes I think we think no one's had to face this before. I hate to tell you this. There's been estimates, maybe 80, 90 billion people on the planet since history began. Millions of people have experienced it before. And God has seen everything. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he's seen it before. And to him, you're still like the first time, but he knows exactly how to help you deal with it. And he'll provide the way of escape to keep you from either sin or from turning from him. But a lot of this happens through the idea of conviction of the Holy Spirit. And right when we think we have overcome temptation, we have it whipped, we don't have to worry about it anymore, we're actually most susceptible. We're setting ourselves up for failure. We have to stay alert and responsive to the Holy Spirit. We have to stay alert and responsive to conviction. Many years ago, we bought a house that had a large Bradford pear tree in the front. It was already large. What's the life expectancy of a Bradford pear tree in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Probably 10 years. I think this thing was at least 10 years when we bought the house. A few years later, a windstorm came through, and our daughter Katie, who I would guess was 12 or so at the time, she came from her bedroom through the living room, glanced out the window, saw the tree, picked up speed, and came bounding into the family room where I was. And with energy and enthusiasm and a sense of urgency, she announced to me, Dad, we're dangerously in trouble. You ever have something like that that your kids say, and from then on it is part of your family's lexicon? Only you know what it means. Only you know kind of where it came from. That has become part of, of my lexicon, because our daughter Katie said it. The tree split in half. Half of it fell against the house. It was no big deal. Nothing was really damaged. But I never forgot those words. Dad, we're dangerously in trouble. You know what Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 10, 12? If you think you're standing firm, be careful, because you are dangerously in trouble. Right when we think we're standing firm, we are setting ourselves up. We have to stay sensitive to conviction of the Holy Spirit. And last point on conviction you may experience conviction that relates to that thing in your past. God may want you to address something from your past. For example, by reaching out to another person. That thing in your past, he doesn't want you to feel guilt and shame and condemnation for it, but he may not be done with it. He may not be done with it. He may want you to do something with it. Don't miss the opportunity to change your future path with regard to the past issue. If there's an action item in the here and now, if you're feeling led to do something, that's almost certainly conviction and you should follow it. That's very different than guilt. So, here's our takeaways today. Number one, you have a job and you have work to do. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ and you have work to do and it's the best work you'll ever do in your entire life. It doesn't get any better than when you're doing God's work. Number two, guilt is a counterproductive obstruction in doing the work God has just for you. And I want you to remember, guilt stems from things in your past. Number three, we need to stop looking back, live with a view to the future, and go for it. 
Stop looking back. Jesus has dealt with that. He's paid the price for it. It's done. It's closed. Uncovering, unpacking, discovering the work God has for you is the best thing you'll do in your life with the time you've got here. We need to stop looking back and go for it. And number four, conviction is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Guidance to help us steer clear of sinful behaviors, actively move toward what God wants us to do, and make the most of our very short time that we have here. Let me close our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, I look at these beautiful people in here, and all I, can, all I see really are their faces, and uh, they look great to me. You see their souls. You see what the burdens are that they're carrying. You know about their past, and you've dealt with it. You've already paid for it. Jesus, you've done all that work, and then you sat down. It's done. There's no more repetition. There's no more futility. It's completed. And you know who's burdened by it. You know who's shackled by it, who is living under the dark cloud of something or some stuff in their past. And I just pray that through our time today, not through my words, but through your word, I pray that they would, would be and feel and know they are set free. And more than that, I pray that they would focus on discovering what you want them to do because it's the best stuff they'll ever do in their life. Thank you so much, Father, for the opportunity for me to be here. Thank you for Adam and this church. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us, and it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. What a wonderful sermon to hear as we prepare our hearts for communion today. And I'd like you to keep Scott's words in mind and keep those passages of Scripture in mind as we take communion together today. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to invite our communion stewards to come forward and prepare the elements. And as they do, could we all pray together? Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and to die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will. A perfect sacrifice for the whole world. So we offer these gifts, sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Come as you are ready. The table is open.